Hey guys, it's your boy Chill here. Welcome back to STD Gems. Today we are looking at the uh, the final piece of the Sorted Ranges uh, puzzle here. We've got these functions that we're going to look at and then we're done that section. Actually, it's getting a little exciting here because we don't got much left and then we're done the entire algorithms section here. We've so yeah, we're almost done algorithm and uh, I'm excited, but today I'm gonna look at these guys. They're not that complicated to understand and they can come in handy every now and then. So let's jump right in there. Now, so the first two functions we're gonna look at here, merging, it's very simple. You have two ranges that are sorted and you wanna combine the elements into a single range that is sorted. So a naive way of doing that would be, okay, I'm just gonna take this range, I'm gonna append it to the end of this range and then I'm gonna run std sort on that. And that would be, you know, big O and log N complexity, which, you know, it's not bad, but we could do better. If you already, if the ranges are already sorted, then you can actually just merge them in a yeah, big O of N time complexity, which is, you know, obviously faster. I mean, the way the algorithm would work, it's not that hard to figure out. It's just you would have uh, pointers or iterators to the beginning of these ranges and then you would look at which one is smaller. Well, zero is smaller, so you would insert the zero, and then you would advance this pointer, and then you would compare which one is smaller. Well, one is smaller, so you'd insert the one, you would advance which one is smaller. Well, the three is smaller, and you'd go on like that, marching them until they both reach the end. The interface is pretty simple. Actually, let me show you something cool. If you log in, I uh, retweeted this on my Twitter a little while back, but on cppreference.com, if you create an account and log in, you can actually choose to narrow it down to a specific revision of the C++ standard and it reduces the clutter quite a bit. But anyways, so there are two main versions here. The uh, 3 and 4, they take a comparator and 1 and 2 just uses the less than comparator. Uh, but yeah, you, you put in the first range, the second range to merge, and the output. So here we got the first range, like this, and then the second range. And for the output, we just want to insert into this empty vector so we go std back inserter v3 and then we're good to go now yeah, we can output the results like this and when we run it yeah here we get the expected result the two inputs are sorted the output is also sorted you see here we got duplicates of the five and they come in here five five everything in its correct order very simple you got another version here that is in place merge and that's if you have uh two basically two separate ranges in the same container uh, and both of the ranges are sorted and you want to merge them into a single range that is sorted. I don't think this one would probably be very useful in many cases, but eh, it, might, it might come up, I don't know. So that's these guys here. They're very, obviously very simple to understand and probably, you know, very useful. You're going to reach to them every now and then when you want to maintain some sorted ranges, when you want to merge them. Very good to have in your back pocket. Now these guys here, they're a little more specialized, they're a little more interesting. Basically what they do is it's set theory. I mean, I think we've all done Venn diagrams in school at some point. Uh, you've got your intersection, the things that are common to two sets. You've got your union here, which is the entire set of things that are in either A or B, or both. And then you've got your symmetric difference, which is everything except the things that are common to both sets. And this relative complement, I, I think of this as just a difference. It's basically, what if you uh, took this one and you subtracted this one from it, you would get this, which is, to me, this is the difference, but apparently it's a relative complement. I don't know. It doesn't matter what you call it. Again, you can compute the difference, the intersection, the symmetric difference, and the union there. And you can also see if one set is completely included in another set. So, I mean, let's try this out. Let's try to find the union between these two sets here. So, we'll do set union. And I believe the signature might actually be the same. Yeah, it just takes in two ranges and outputs to a single output iterator. Uh, so, that works fine. And if we run it, I guess I was a little too quick on the draw there deleting these guys. We still need them. But yeah, if we, uh, we do that, we run it, we can see that the union of these two sets is just all of the elements, all the numbers um, that appear in either one of those sets, but uh, duplicates between sets, for example, both sets have a 5, and but there's only one 5 in the output. So it's different, it's similar to a merge, except that duplicates between our sets are not duplicated in the output. 
Now, one interesting thing about duplicates here, and I just want to quickly cover it, the behavior is, uh, let's say you have a duplicate in this set, and it's not duplicated here, but it exists. What will the output be? Make a guess. And here we see the output is two fives. So basically, the number of fives, if this one has more fives than this one, it'll be the number of fives that is in this one. But if we had three fives in V2, then three fives would come out here. So you take the maximum of the number of duplicates between these two, and that's the number that gets outputted. All right, let's try the intersection. Uh, so what do we expect to happen? Well, we expect only things that are common between them uh, should appear. So we, sh we should expect 5 and 12 is, I believe, all we will get. And indeed, that is what we get, 5 and 12. Awesome. Let's try the set difference. And we'll see what we get here. Well, let's let's uh, see what we expect. I guess the difference we would expect now, the uh, things that were in common, 5 and 12, are going to be removed from uh, V1. And yeah, we see 1, 8, 9, 14. So 5 and 12 were removed from V1 because they also existed in V2. Now let's see a little experiment. Let's see if we have two 5s in V1. One of them is removed, but one of them is kept. And if we put a, a second 5 in here, then they're both removed. If we put a third 5 in here, I don't think that changes it. It doesn't, it doesn't put a negative 5. Yeah, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah. So basically, it's pretty easy to predict, pretty easy to understand the behavior of these set operations, if you are at least a little familiar with set theory in general. Symmetric difference. I guess for completion's sake, let's show the last one. What symmetric difference is going to be is the union of them minus the intersection. And there you have it. There's all the elements that appear in either one minus the ones that appear in both. And you might say, yeah, there's a five in here though. Well, yeah, because this one only had one five. This one has two fives. So the intersection is one five. One five is removed from this set, but one five still remains. Everything in its proper place. Beautiful. Now you might be saying, Chili, that looks cool and all, but I don't really see where I'm going to use this, you know, in like a game or something. So let me give you a BS scenario that I just pulled out of my butt. So let's say you've got like an RPG or something, you've got characters. Your characters have a set of, you know, special moves or abilities that they have. And for some reason, I don't know, you want to give the player a view on, you know, the, the total set of abilities across all characters. You know, not without duplicates, just put all your characters together and here are a list of all the abilities that they collectively possess as a team. All right. Um, and so you could do that with just, you know, I mean, here I'm using strings to represent the abilities, but in your game, it could be a pointer to some kind of a smart ability object. Uh, but anyways, you get the idea. You can basically collect all of these different sets into a single set by doing unions. Now, one thing you need to note here, and this is important, and that is if you're building up, you know, multiple things, you're accumulating a set, um, you actually need two buffers. Because if I were to take the union of these two guys and put it in this output set, um, I couldn't then take the union of this one and this one and put it in the output, because the output must not overlap with any of the inputs. So you need another buffer so you can take from this one and this one, take the union and put it into this one. But once you've done that, let's say we wanted to add a fourth one, we could then reuse this buffer here. So you can ping pong between two buffers, but you need two. You can't do it with just a single buffer. But anyways, not important. What is important is that if we do this, you see here, we get the full set of abilities without any duplicates. And that's useful. Now let's say in the game, you know, there are special events and the result of the special event depends on the total skill set of all the characters in your party. So it's a, it's a basic check. So let's say for the event, we've got a set of required moves here. And uh, now we need to do the check to see if the event is uh, successful or not. The outcome of the event. So an easy way to do this, we can use std includes to see if uh, the uh, set of required abilities is a subset of the of the abilities that we have in our team. So we just do std includes and then we give our two ranges. Just a quick double check here. The first range is the uh, the range that we're going to be examining and the second range 
is the one that we're checking to see if it is a subset or not. So, in this case, the first range is going to be our buffer that contains the union, and the second range is going to be the required moves. We want to see if that is a subset. So it'll return true if the event is successful and false if it is a failure. And it returns false because we can see that the Alabama Hot Pocket, uh, no one currently possesses that ability. But if we were to, say, grant that ability to one of our characters, now we see it passes. So there you go, just a basic little usage scenario. And one thing to always note is that these operations only work on sorted ranges. So your data has to be sorted. And if you're outputting it sorted and possibly even storing it sorted in your system, then that's not a big deal. And as we've seen in the previous video, storing sorted allows for good things like being able to do a binary search. If I were to remove the, uh, the sort call here, and run this again, you're going to get a debug assertion. So the standard library even does a check for you to make sure that you're, try you're running your stuff on a sorted sequence. But obviously, if you put it into release mode, it's not going to run those checks for you because, you know, that's a waste of performance. But there you have it. There are the set operations and also the merging. And that concludes our, our little tutorial arc here on sorted ranges. So. In the next video, we are going to be looking at the heap operations. It's actually an interesting topic. Like binary search, we are going to first approach this by studying the, uh, the data structure known as a heap. Because it's pretty important in computer science, it's pretty useful. Then after we've studied the theory of heaps, we will look at the functions that are available to us in the standard library. Until then, thanks for watching, hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please click the like button, it helps a lot. And I will see you soon with some more STD gems.